What is the condition of free speech in America today? I'm Sanford Unger, director of the Free Speech Project at Georgetown University. And on this video series, Speaking Freely, we'll be talking from time to time to thought leaders and major players in the free speech drama unfolding in America. Today, Joe Cohn from the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, or FIRE, joins us in the studio. talking today with Joe Cohn, who is the Legislative and Policy Director for FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. Joe, I wonder if you could uh, give the uh, people who will be watching this discussion a brief but reasonably comprehensive description of what FIRE is, just what it does. It'd be my pleasure, and thank you for having me today. We're glad uh, to have FIRE you. FIRE is a national nonpartisan nonprofit organization that's dedicated exclusively to defending the free speech and due process rights of students and faculty in higher education. And historically, we've done that in two ways, by proactively working with universities before there's a particular problem while working with their policies, and also engaging with universities after there's been a, con a controversy defensively to defend students and faculty when those rights have been threatened. I lead our government relations department, a department we started five years ago, to expand on that work. Uh, I want to get to what you do as legislative and policy director in just a moment, but um, this issue of working with universities, uh, some universities think that you actually have an effect of intimidating them because you give these ratings, these red lights, yellow lights, and green lights, if I'm not mistaken, and that there's a sort of club held over their heads to uh, try to satisfy FIRE and not end up on the wrong list? Well, I don't know that it's a particular club. We hope that schools want to get green lights and don't want to have red lights. That's not unintended. But we use it to make sure that students and prospective students understand clearly what their rights are. So do you think there are people who, when they're looking at colleges and universities they're going to apply to, do you think there are people who look at the FIRE ratings before applying or before deciding to enroll? We get regular emails from members of the public saying, you know, I'm looking at schools for my you know, daughter who's graduating high school this year. I only want her to go to a green light school. Do you have any advice for us? And uh, we uh, love responding to those emails. We hope that more students look at what their actual rights will be on the ground before they select uh, schools. We think it's an important criteria for students to be aware of. I'd like you to tell me about your role as legislative and policy director at FIRE. Uh, it conjures up a slight notion of a guy going around uh, with a satchel with model legislation in it, visiting state legislators and and telling them what FIRE's advice is? Well, absolutely. Part of the role is in government relations, making sure that you get the word out to lawmakers who are thinking of getting involved in these issues in higher ed and advising them on good ways, thoughtful ways to approach the issue that will be helpful and expand the free speech and due process rights of, of everyone. So what do you do? Let's say you're arriving in Nashville, Tennessee, which is one of the places I think you're particularly proud of, FIRE is particularly proud of your work. What do you do when you get to town? Well, usually we'll meet with a bill's sponsor. We'll talk to them about the legislation. And, and have you provided the bill in advance? It depends on which one of the situations. Um, we don't go to seek out legislative sponsors. They come to us. Um, and w what's interesting about that is that we dance with the ones who brung us. 
and uh, it, and and when someone decides to introduce legislation, we'll usually uh, I'll register as a lobbyist in that state. We'll engage and we'll talk to them about what. Uh, we can do to help make the case uh, for the legislation if we if we like it. If we have concerns about the legislation, we have conversations in depth with them about where we see room for improvement, where we see potential pitfalls and problems with the bills. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, we're hoping to get the constitutional lines exactly right in every piece of legislation that we speak on. So you don't you don't come with a model statute. Uh, we do a bit of that too. You if, do. if when when a legislator calls us and says you know, we're interested in introducing free speech legislation for campuses, what do you think we can do together? Uh, we're happy to, to to share what we've done in the past that's been successful. Um, we have. Uh, a bill that I'm particularly proud of called the Campus uh, Free Expression Act, a uh, CAFE, if you will, and it's designed to eliminate free speech zones on campus. So it's not tackling every kind of campus censorship, but a common form of campus censorship that, uh, that we know that we can successfully eliminate statutorily. So please explain to me why you want to eliminate campus free speech zones, what so, it is that you find objectionable about sure. them. So for your listeners, I want to make sure they understand first and foremost that the phrase free speech zone is really quite misleading. They're really quarantine zones. They're places where it's the only spot on campus students are allowed to engage. Is that always the case? Yeah, pretty exclusively. Um, they're designed to be the one place where free speech rights uh, you know, are supposed to exist according to these according to these policies. Where when you're outside of them, uh, the the rights are much more limited, and that's not the way it's supposed to operate uh, in a society where you're expecting your universities to be, you know, true marketplaces of ideas, the kind of places where you have free exchange of of, of, of ideas and thought. So once you have schools saying you can't distribute literature in these open outdoor areas, you can only do it in this plaza or at that amphitheater, or quite frankly, in some of the examples, this location that's the size of a parking lot, uh, you're, you're running into some serious problems. And you know some of these free speech zones are quite comical. We challenged years ago the free speech gazebo at Texas Tech. A university that had 28,000 students enrolled, but you could only exercise your free speech rights if you reserved the gazebo. That was a very advance. small place, I take it. <laughs> yes, yeah, yes, it was not a supersized gazebo. But what about gazebo. what about a situation where, generally speaking, free speech is not suppressed on a campus? However, an area is designated as an especially robust place. For free speech, where arguments can take place, where chalking occurs on the on the ground or on walls, where where people expect to come to engage in a kind of free speech exchange. I think we've seen a few schools that have used locations that are available to reserve for bigger and larger events, and that's fine when they're not exclusive to here the only places you're allowed to engage in those activities. Um, it's fine when those locations can be used freely when no one else has reserved them, but that's not the norm. Really what we tend to see is the selection of a few locations uh, that can be used for these expressive activities. And they don't tend to make distinctions between events with big groups and one student who wants to distribute flyers even though they have very different considerations in terms of the interest that the school has in regulating the behavior. Right. I, I, I've heard some people defend free speech zones as a kind of like speaker's corner in Hyde Park in London, famous place where people come and sometimes literally set up a, a soapbox uh, or a, an orange crate to stand on and people come and listen to them or don't come and listen to them as they want to. But as a as a kind of speaker's corner, a modern speaker's corner. Yeah, and that's fine if you want to promote a location where you'd rather people engage in that behavior, but it's not okay when it's the only location people are allowed to engage in the behavior, and that's a really important So these are nuances, and not every place that has a free speech zone is necessarily what you're describing. Some of them might actually be 
robust locations where? A vast, vast majority use it in the restrictive way. Uh, it's very rare for it to go the other direction. And, and, that's, and that's really the problem that we have. I mean, we have one in 10 institutions in the country maintain free speech zones. And what that tells me is, is two things. One is that 90% of institutions don't have them and the sky hasn't fallen, which really undermines the argument that they're necessary. Um, but it also tells me it's still a significant problem. The other 90% they could be places where every place is a free speech zone, or they could be places where no place is a free speech zone. No, that's not how, the, how they're really unfolding how with, the, with, the, with, 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 the, with the policies. Um, and, but really the key here is that open outdoor areas should be regulated the same way open outdoor areas would be regulated off of campus, which isn't anything and everything goes, but they're subject to narrowly tailored time, place, and manner restrictions that are content and viewpoint right. neutral that have to be tied to a significant governmental interest and leave open ample alternative modes of communication. I know that was a mouthful, but that's the actual legal standard. No, I standard. understand that. The, the language of free speech court decisions and so on has, has right. developed into a fairly arcane vocabulary. Uh, th tell me about some of the particular victories, if you will, in state legislatures that you feel proud of on behalf of FIRE? So, so there are a number of them uh, that, we're, that we're really proud of. The first victory was in Virginia. Virginia was the first bill uh, that we got passed uh, to eliminate free speech zones on, on campus. And right after we got that bill passed... This is fairly recent, signed by Governor McAuliffe? Yes, uh, by fairly recent, I'm trying to remember if it was 2013 or 2014. But, uh, but, uh, but, but since uh, Terry McAuliffe has been the governor yes, of Virginia. Yes, and, uh, and after it was passed in a December editorial in the Wall Street Journal, that bill was called the single biggest victory for free speech advocates in the country for the year, uh, in their end of the year you know, editorial. We're really right. proud of that, uh, of that recognition. And it, now this is only in public institutions. That only in public institutions right. because that's where, that's uh, the, where the First Amendment the, applies. Right. Although I would say, as a free speech organization, we're constantly trying to make the case that the concept of free speech is bigger than the First Amendment. The First Amendment deals with government censorship right. and draws those legal lines. But free speech is a value. A com communities where you're allowed to speak your mind and maybe suffer whatever social ramifications come from being considered thoughtful or being considered a jerk, you know, being okay, but, uh, but where we don't routinely try to punish and take away livelihoods uh, of, of, of people for in engaging in disagreements is an important value as well that's important for people to keep, to keep in mind. Free speech as a concept is more valuable when we respect and want to hear out other people's opinions. Right, but there is probably some question as to the authority of state legislatures telling private institutions, small liberal arts colleges, for example, what they can or cannot do exactly. in this area. Only one state has gotten involved with private institutions. Which in is way, that? And that's California. They passed the Leonard Law well before FIRE was engaged in uh, legislative stuff, and I believe actually a couple of years before uh, we were founded as an organization because we uh, were launched in 1999. And tell us what the Leonard Law says. So the Leonard Law says that private, secular institutions of higher education must uh, avoid punishing students for speech that would be protected in public institutions. So it doesn't deal with all forms of censorship. The plain language of the bill deals exclusively with punishments for having already right. engaged in, in what would be protected speech. And it was... Um, the the bill's constitutionality, I guess I should say law's constitutionality, was subject to a, a lawsuit um, at, at Stanford uh, back in the late 90s. And uh, Robert Corey, then a third year law student and a few of his classmates, were challenging the overbroad sexual harassment policy at Stanford at, under the Leonard Law. And the court concluded not only was Stanford's policy overbroad, but the Leonard Law was, was appropriate and constitutional. At Stanford, so it's Stan been reinforced. It by has been state and, court decisions, right? And and that that opinion wasn't put on appeal. So 
Um, so that's that still stands. So that California. still stands. Uh, so to this so day. back to the present. Um, what are some of the other states that, besides Virginia, where you're right. proud of your work? So after Virginia, we had a string of successes. Um, uh, Missouri, in particular, uh, we worked very closely with legislators to get another CAFE Act passed, and then we started seeing some states introducing CAFE Acts without reaching out to us, just you know, liking what they saw in the other states and 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 using and using language, and that happened, you know, for example, in Arizona. So, in some ways, I'm also very proud of, of that that people are seeing that the work is viable, seeing that the work is is, is important. And, and moving forward, and you know, we've we've had great success there. We've had uh, Colo Colorado uh, and Utah both passed uh, CAFE acts in this last session, and you mentioned Tennessee. Uh, Tennessee passed a really comprehensive uh, free speech bill that uh, that that really, in a, in many ways, advanced the ball to defeat a, a number of additional forms of censorship on college campuses. For example. So it, in addition to tackling free speech zones, it also uh, defined harassment using the Supreme Court case law as opposed to the hodgepodge of definitions that we're seeing coming out of schools across the country. And that's really important because uh, Overbroad harassment codes are the single most common way that we see censorship on college campuses. Overbroad harassment codes, is that what a lot of people would think of as attempts to control hate speech? A lot of people, I think, would, would, would put it in that category. Um, and, you know, I think that the key for everyone to remember is that harassment isn't protected speech when it actually meets constitutional definitions, and the Supreme Court has given a constitutional definition. And over and over and over again, courts strike down codes that don't apply that definition faithfully. And it's almost shocking how many schools continue to And that to, definition to use. The, the, is what precisely? So the definition comes from a case called Davis versus Monroe County Board of Education. It's a 1999 case. And it says that sexual harassment in particular must be targeted at a member of a protected class, so on the basis of gender in that instance of sexual harassment, and has to be objectively offensive to a reasonable person, severe and pervasive, to a degree that it actually pr prevents the target from enjoying one of the benefits of the institution. And that's really important that, that, that courts are looking at all of the criteria there because that's what limits a policy from targeting the kind of behavior that we do want to prevent, repeated, objectively you know, offensive behavior that really is both severe and pervasive as, a, as opposed to preventing behaviors that might be rude and obnoxious but that you expect people to engage in as they Disagree and as they and as they learn in a learning environment, right. it's slightly different from the, educa for the education standard from the workplace standard, uh, which allows it to be uh, severe or persistent instead. So, uh, this kind of uh, harassment, so-called harassment, which is not just confined to sexual harassment, as, mm -hmm. as I understand it, are there some cases where students who've arrived at just arrived at college or university um, may not be capable of defending themselves, may not be capable of answering and of, and of uh, preventing themselves from being harmed and need some protection from the institution or their, their uh, fellow students or, or, or somebody. Is there, not, is there not some worry over affording no protection at all? Well, I think I would be very troubled if we were providing no protection at all. I mean, I think right. that's, that would be a, a disaster. One of the reasons why the Supreme Court reached the precise definition that it did is because it was recognizing that people are actually harassed. There are cases that meet that standard, and we need to be actively engaged at addressing them. Uh, when that happens. That, that, that's really important. And what I see too often is that it's phrased 
in an all or nothing kind of way of if we if I can't use any definition that I right. want of sexual harassment then you're not protecting against sexual harassment and of that of co that of course I I isn't true so we really need to focus on making sure that schools are using the right definitions but once they have the right definitions in place they're actively using those policies and not just letting accusations allegations be swept under uh, under the right. rug or go ignored. That's the second half of the equation that also needs people to really be be vigilant. One of the objections I've heard to some of the state laws is that they order institutions not to disinvite speakers ever, as far as I can tell. Is that is that appropriate for a state legislature to be inserting itself in? And I realize these are only public institutions for the most part inserting themselves into the affairs of colleges and universities and saying once you've invited a speaker or once somebody on your campus has invited a speaker you're stuck with the speaker come what may well there are, are a couple things I would I'd say here um, one is there's an important distinction to be made between an institution disinviting a speaker that it itself has invited you invite a uh, celebrity and three weeks later they're indicted on 30 counts of uh, any particular heinous crime uh, that you want to decide that you know you maybe you don't want that person to be your speaker well I don't think anyone would say that that's unreasonable so for the reasonable to person that. standard would apply there that that's a well I think I think even if it was an unreasonable decision the institution itself deciding who it wants to to, to honor to, to honor or invite or for recognize. itself is is different from telling a student organization that because the institution doesn't like uh, the point of view, the viewpoints, the degree of integrity it perceives the speaker to have, that it is deciding for the, institu for, for the organization who it can and can't invite and listen to. So the Tennessee legislation, for example, makes that distinction and says that institutions can cancel their own speakers but can't cancel speakers that have been invited by you know, faculty, students, or student organizations. So that's an important distinction first. Um, the, the, the second, and, and I think really another important you know, thing here, is that the case law hasn't provided an all or nothing approach here either. Um, what the case law has said, and it's not specific to institutions of higher education, but with broader applicability, is that uh, in the context of trying to balance public safety and free speech, governments have an obligation to try to protect people who want to engage in peaceful constitutional rights before they give in to mobs of censorship. And it's not an unlimited you know, responsibility. Their hands aren't tied to always allow speech to proceed no matter what, um, but they have to take reasonable measures uh, first to try to protect the constitutional speech. And what they've done will be evaluated under a reasonableness uh, test applying strict scrutiny. And for the, the non-lawyers who are watching the program, um, what, that, what that means is that schools have to make bona fide efforts through reasonable things at their disposal to protect you know, the, the right speakers. And um, I'll let you interject for a second, well, but no, I want I, to explain, I, the, 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 uh, what, if we can get back to it in a moment, why that's the case. Okay. Um, Imagine, if you will, for a moment, a circumstance in which someone is invited to speak where there is a plausible reason to predict violence, that they might be armed exercising their Second Amendment mm -hmm. rights, which may come into conflict with First Amendment rights at times, and, uh, and an institution or its president or its board or somebody uh, is worried about violence, is worried about physical harm to people. Is that not an appropriate time to disinvite a speaker? So there are two phases of the analysis that the courts really say you have to go through. The first thing is you need to figure out whether you're concerned about the speaker engaging in you know, unprotected speech itself, because a lot of people claim that some of the speech a speaker will engage in uh, is you know, hate speech, and therefore they shouldn't be allowed on campus. And of course, the courts have not recognized hate speech right. as an unprotected well, category. I'm speaking for the moment about physical harm, right. not, not psychological. Well, I want, well, well, right. I want to talk about the, the, the two phases. The first right. is, are they actually engaging in unprotected speech? True threats, for example, you know, which are carefully defined by uh, Virginia versus Black as having an intent to actually, you know, 
cause someone to reasonably right. believe that they're going to be actually physically harmed. Um, harassment, as we've already discussed, fighting words, there are a few other categories of unprotected speech. So one analysis is about what the speaker will actually say. This, and if you don't have evidence or reasonable basis for believing that they're in, going to be engaging in unprotected speech, you know, the courts have been, been very uh, disapproving of prior restraints of analyzing what people will say in advance and for that. good reason. The second step of the analysis is audience reaction which has also historically been disfavored as an analysis, but where, uh, where I, the case law has been pretty thoughtful is dealing with really real life serious dangerous situations uh, in a manner that isn't just hypothetical, but gives thoughtful kind of tools for, for public governments to, governments to figure out what they can and can't do. And that's why they go under strict scrutiny and, and that they don't, you know, after the fact, you can look at what a government actor did and said, did they take reasonable steps to protect well, someone exercising their constitutional rights first? Because if they didn't, and you go back to the 1960s in Alabama, they would have used public riots as a means right. to justify shutting down the civil rights movement. Right, and there's some fear that some states are now passing laws that would do just that. That right. would that would use protest as a reason to shut down speech in, in some cases. Right. But let's uh, look at the events in Charlottesville in August 2017, mm -hmm. Charlottesville, Virginia. Not strictly speaking a university case, mm -hmm. although they did impinge and fringe upon the university's uh, boundaries in that case. But there were people who came there, white supremacists, white nationalists, um, been labeled racist, many of the people. I think we can do that, say that about the Ku Klux Klan, for example. I have no problem calling the Klan racist. Right. Um, they came there looking for trouble, and and there there's some been some videos and some things in which they've spoken, in which they've said, "We came here to fight." And famous scene where one of the leaders is taking the five weapons out of his clothes, and after things are over, um, would we might have saved a life and quite a few injuries perhaps if stricter standards had been applied to that to that rally to that protest effort i think it still needed to be evaluated under actual true threat you know doctrine uh, before you engage in in prior restraints when someone comes in and at that point talking about you know, weapons and and, and 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 there to fight. You have maybe a stronger basis in that particular well, narrow instance, but it can't be used as a blanket, broad, uh, you know, justification for saying that members of the Klan or other racists can't hold their can't hold their rallies. Right. Um, no, I I understand that. But what we have here is, for you know, it's not an ideal situation. But we have afterwards, we have the results on which we evaluate this. And so uh, the question is what, what level of results or what level of harm would it take to create some corollary to the standard that says, you know, if you have some reason to believe, even a slight reason to believe, that there might be violence, that this is not perspective protected speech anymore. Well, you can't use only a slight reason to believe because in that instance you would have had a slight reason to believe that there may have been violence in the civil rights movement in the South again. And, you know, and certainly people could have been and were hurt uh, engaging in, 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 in obviously in clear protected, you know, speech to try to change the way our country views race relations and defeat segregation. And if we use the, 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 the standard of slight reason to believe that there might be violence to shut down people engaging in their constitutional rights, we would be in a much different country. So, And on a slippery slope, I, I, I recognize that. But, but I think there's one other thing. You can, we can look at the situation in retrospect and say that it doesn't look like the city of Charlottesville was as prepared as they should have been for what unfolded. And you can have the right standard and still have it applied in real time insufficiently in a way that causes in a way that causes real harm to real people and and that appears to to really tragically be what happened. I think some of the in, blame in, is in been put on the some of the blame has been put on the political leadership and the law enforcement authorities in Charlottesville. Well they were very focused on moving the rally from one location to another. Uh, and and I'm not sure that that was really where the focus should have should have been, 
Um, and I would be interested in hearing what other law enforcement experts have right. to say about what they could have done better, not because I want to be critical of them, but because we want to learn from, from what happened and, and deal with things sure. better. Uh, you have uh, a list, uh, I, I guess it's called a disinvitation database, uh, where speakers have been disinvited from campuses or protested in some way. Uh, I don't know if it's in advance mm -hmm. or only during the appearance. Uh, but it does seem to be that most of the speakers on that list were protested by students from the left and not from the right. Uh, is this, do, do you think this is representative of what's happening in the country? Because there are some examples that are, for example, not in that database where people were intimidated from speaking or invitations were withdrawn of speakers on the left that were protested from the Please right. Please let us know if you see things that aren't in the database. Well, two so we come to mind. Um, one, one is a Princeton professor named uh, Kianga Yamata Taylor who uh, spoke at a commencement speech at uh, Hampshire College in Massachusetts and then had several other invitations withdrawn after some cell phone video was circulated and broadcast on Fox News, et cetera. Yeah, and we've spoken up on that, on that case too. Um, but it's and, not and in your about, database. I don't know how often we update the, data, the database, but, uh, but I'll be consulting with my colleagues about that to see, uh, to see what's going on there. But um, what I can tell you in terms of the representative representative nature of it is that we don't view campus censorship in, in, in strictly partisan terms because censorship is not really a, a partisan tool. People censor who they disagree with. Um, but, but, it, but if you do the head count of just where the cases are coming from in recent modern times, more of the censorship does happen to come from the left. Um, because they happen to have leadership from the left at or universities. Or the attempts at censorship. Right, the, right and the attempts at censorship um, because the leadership of more universities in 2017 tends to come from that direction uh, on the political spectrum. So the, the perception that, that they will succeed because you're appealing to, you know, to you know, the confirmation bias of the people in leadership is, is kind of powerful. But I would also point out to anyone who's, who's watching the program, that there are plenty of examples of censorship that come from conservatives, too. Yes, there because, are, there and, are and, examples. And, they, and don't get as much, they don't get as much attention or as much publicity. We, we give them as much attention uh, and, 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 and address them as forcefully as we can, too, because to us, this is not a partisan issue. So you don't think there's a risk of fire coming to be identified with the right side of the political spectrum when it purports to be a nonpartisan organization? Well, I don't think we just purport to be a nonpartisan organization. I can tell you from my experience that my colleagues okay. and my board are evenly divided along the, the, along the political spectrum. And I can tell you in the way that we behave that we tackle cases regardless of where they come. I mean, I've had... But back to my question. Is there a risk right. of uh, your being perceived as defending the right the, the the right side of the political I don't spectrum think it's rather just, than the left. I don't think it's just a risk in terms of the perception because we get the accusations all of the time. But interestingly enough, at our holiday party each year, we read the hate mail that we get from various people throughout the year. And we have two lines, people reading letters that come from people from the left accusing us of being uh, conservative shells and letters from the right accusing us of being Pinko commie liberals, and we alternate because we get we get both because we we defend people, and we have defended people from every side of every controversial culture war issue that that's happened. We've defended pro-choice uh, people and pro-life people. We've defended pro-gun people and pro uh, and pro-gun control people. You name it, we've we've been on the front lines. Uh, but but the risk is there because when you just do the head count of the cases, more of the cases happen to be of conservatives being censored. And people remember what they see the most and what gets amplified the most. So um, we do the same work either way, and it's so to some degree out of our control what other people you know, perceive when they're just looking at the most recent thing. One, one last point before we conclude. Uh, what do you think overall FIRE's impact has been since it appeared on the scene and, and tried to do this. Have, are, are, are you more of a lightning rod today than you, than you were originally? Because Well, I'm really proud of what we've been able to accomplish. Um, we've had a tremendous amount of success in reducing the, the number of unconstitutional policies at, at uh, institutions of higher education. The issue itself 
uh, is now one of the most prominent issues in the country. I don't know if that would have been the case without, uh, without our in involvement. Um, whether we are more of a lightning rod is really more of a focus of the broader tensions that are happening across, uh, across the country and the way that clashes along free speech lines are bringing to the forefront the intense amounts of disagreements we have as a nation. And um, I think that th it's better to have those differences out in the open than pretending as if they don't exist. So uh, I I'm really proud of the work that FIRE does and, and looking forward to continuing it for the years to come. And the funding for FIRE comes primarily from where? Primarily from individual donors and also foundations. Um, we have... Do they uh, have a political tint? Well, we other? take donations from people from entirely across the political spectrum as well. I guarantee you if you look at our donors, you'll find people who you like and people who you despise uh, <laughs> on, on, on the list. I mean, we have... I have a very short list of people I despise. Well, I probably shouldn't be, when I say you, talking specifically okay. about you, but about, but, about, but, about, but about the public in general, is that, uh, is that we have, you know, we have, uh, you know, money from the Koch Foundation. We also get money from the Playboy Foundation. So it's, it, we're not uh, ideologically, you know, I in one direction because we don't function in, in, you know, in, in an ideological manner. And that's really important to our identity and the way that we, that we operate. And I couldn't imagine being at a free speech organization and not vigorously trying to make sure we defeat censorship wherever it's come. You mentioned, um, you know, Tennessee and, uh, and and the Tennessee legislation that that came that was produced by that legislature is fantastic. But in each of the three previous legislative sessions, they went after universities for giving funding for students to have sex weeks that included. Uh, LGBT uh, issues and you know went beyond abstinence and we engaged very publicly criticizing those same legislators that three years down the road were with us and said you know what we want to do the right thing here um, we didn't we don't give people free passes uh, there are no permanent friends and no permanent allies in this work we look and evaluate what's on the table and try to make the case for a robust uh, uh, First Amendment and robust free speech. Joe, thanks very much for being with us today at the Georgetown University Free Speech Project. Thank you so much for having us, and good luck. Thank you. We've been discussing campus speech issues and state legislation with Joe Cohn from FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. To learn more about Georgetown University's Free Speech Project, visit our website. Thanks for watching. I'm Sanford Unger.